Hi, my name is Mr. Barlow, and welcome to episode 16 of the VC Biology Podcast. This episode explains how temperature regulation and water balance is controlled in animals. Thermoregulation is the way that animals control their body temperature. So when talking about body temperature, animals can actually fall into two main categories. They can either be ectothermic, which means that they obtain heat from the external environment. So ecto is outside and thermic is heat, so ectothermic, obtaining heat from the external environment. So an example of an ectothermic animal is uh, well, many species of lizards. And also people who don't know quite as much about biology as you and me sometimes call ectothermic animals cold-blooded animals. But their blood's not really cold. They're, they're really ectothermic. They just get their heat from the external environment. Now, the other main way that animals control their body temperature is endothermy. So basically, that means that they generate and maintain their own body heat. And in fact, they can maintain their body temperature at a particular or specific level. So ectothermic animals are basically at the mercy of their environment. You know, if it's hot outside, they'll be hot. If it's cold outside, they'll be cold. I mean, they can do behavioral things like getting out of the sun uh, and getting into the sun, but that's about all. But endothermic animals actually maintain internal body temperature at a really specific level. In fact, for endothermic animals like humans, if their core body temperature gets about six degrees above the set level, they're dead. So, you know, if you get to about 43 degrees, you are in very, very serious trouble. So it's really important for um, animals you know, like humans to keep their body temperature at the set level, whatever that is. You know, in humans, it's 37 degrees Celsius, while um, in goats, it's about 39 degrees Celsius. So now, while most animals are either ectothermic or endothermic, there are actually some animals that are classified as, classified as heterothermic. So this basically means they function as ectotherms, but they do have um, some ability to generate uh, their own metabolic heat. So for example, some big fish, because they swim so far and so fast, their body temperature can actually get um, quite a number of degrees higher than the water they're swimming in. So, you know, they don't maintain, a, you know, a constant body temperature like an endotherm, but they're not um, totally, their body temperature isn't totally dictated by the environment like an ectotherm. So that's heterothermy. Now in endotherms, the regulation of body temperature actually involves a complex negative feedback system. So this system is triggered when misalignment detectors in the hypothalamus in the brain detect either an abnormally high or abnormally low blood temperature. And there are also uh, temperature receptors in the skin. So these skin temperature receptors act as disturbance detectors and they basically detect changes in the external environment and they trigger you know, the same um, negative feedback systems, but they do it before there's a change in core body temperature. So if there's a change in core body temperature, that's when the uh, misalignment detectors in the hypothalamus pick up the change and you know, do something to get hot or warm again. So if the hypothalamus detects that it's too hot, a series of responses will be initiated. So, for example, the animal will start to sweat uh, and maybe pant more. So this basically increases evaporation, which will help to cool the animal down, thus, you know, negative feedback. Also, blood vessels in the skin of the animal will dilate. So this is called vasodilation. So this brings more blood to the surface of the skin, which basically, basically gives that blood um, a chance to cool down more. Uh, the animal may also get out of the sun, which is a behavioral thing. Uh, in humans, to cool down, you know, humans will take off clothes. And the animal may also decrease metabolic heat production. So, you know when it's really, really hot and sometimes you just feel like sitting there and do, really just doing nothing? Well, you do that because whenever you move around, your muscles generate heat. Whereas when you sit still and do nothing, you don't generate heat. So that's a way that humans, you know, can decrease their metabolic heat production. Now, on the other hand, if the hypothalamus detects that it's too cold, 
then a different series of responses will be initiated. For example, blood vessels in the skin will constrict, so this is called vasoconstriction, and that means that blood will basically stay in the centre of the body to keep warm and not get cold on the surface. And in some animals, insulation, for example, fur or feathers can be increased, so it, it can stand on end, you know, the feathers can ruffle up a bit and make kind of an extra layer of insulation. Uh, contrary to popular belief, that doesn't, doesn't actually work in humans, basically because we don't have enough hair for it to be uh, effective. Well, I, I don't, don't know about you. Uh, another way that uh, an animal can increase body heat is, well, there's behavioural things. So, for example, penguins huddle together. Um, you can get into the sun, so you can move into the sun. If you're a human, you can put on clothes. Uh, an animal can also increase metabolic heat production, you know, just jump around. Animals also do this um, by shivering. Uh, that basically warms up your muscles. You can actually also increase metabolic heat production by increasing the cellular activity in a special type of fat called brown fat. So if you, if you burn the brown fat, it makes you warm and uh, babies actually have brown fat and that's one of the ways that they can uh, regulate their, their temperature. Um, for some animals, if it's just impossible um, to basically maintain body temperature, it's just too cold, some animals hibernate or go into a, a state of torpor and that basically reduces metabolic demands and enables them to survive the winter. And some animals, again, for example, penguins, they've actually got a countercurrent um, arrangement of blood vessels in their extremities. And that results in a reduced heat loss. So the way that this countercurrent heat exchange uh, system works, you know, in the legs, legs of a penguin, is basically uh, their arteries. So arteries carry blood away from the heart, you know, away from the core of the body, which you know is quite warm. The arteries are placed right next to veins, and the veins carry the blood from you know the legs or from the feet back up to the heart. So the arteries, the blood from the heart comes down the artery, and it's quite warm. But as it gets closer and closer to the foot, it gets colder and colder. It then, you know, delivers oxygen and collects carbon dioxide in the cells of the foot. And then that blood goes back up through the vein, which is right next to the artery. So the cold blood from the foot goes back up through the vein, but it's right next to that hot artery. So the artery, arterial blood, basically gives its heat to the venous blood. So, you know, the venous blood ends up getting warmer as it goes back up to the heart. The arterial blood gets colder as it goes... Um, down to the feet. So basically what you end up with is, is the core body temperature, the core blood stays warm and the foot blood stays cold. So that's basically um, the countercurrent exchange of heat in uh, the legs and feet of a penguin. And obviously that's yet another way that temperature is regulated in animals. So I've talked all about thermoregulation, and I want to move on to osmoregulation. So osmoregulation is basically the way that water and salt concentrations are maintained, you know, at homeostatic levels. So in fact, you know, both of those things do need to be um, maintained at pretty precise levels for an organism to function properly. So water balance or osmoregulation is interesting to look at when we consider three types of uh, aquatic animals. So the first one is freshwater fish. And freshwater fish in their natural environment, they'll lose um, body salts by diffusion and they'll actually um, get more water via osmosis. So this will happen the whole time in freshwater. And they've adapted to this environment by, um, well, several things. So what they do is they rarely drink water. So, you know, because <clears throat> they're constantly gaining water by osmosis. And they also uh, excrete lots and lots and lots of really dilute urine. So, you know, they're absorbing water all the time, but they're also excreting uh, lots of water all the time in their urine. And they also actively absorb salts from their surroundings. So this stops them losing too much salt and it's how, you know, they maintain their, their water and uh, salt concentrations. So the next aquatic organism is a marine fish. So they're in a very different environment to freshwater fish. You know, there's far more salt in that water. And basically in a marine environment, uh, a fish would naturally gain salt from their environment and they would also lose water to their environment. So they've basically adapted to that environment. Um, they've adapted to the losing water thing by they always drink lots and lots of water. 
but they actually only excrete small amounts of urine, so they don't lose much water. And uh, marine fish also actually act actually actively excrete salt out of their bodies so that the concentration of salt in their bodies doesn't get too high. And the last type of marine animal um, I'll um, talk about when I'm talking about osmoregulation is some marine invertebrates and cartilaginous fish. What they actually do is, is they just simply maintain body fluids which have an osmotic concentration which is nearly equal to seawater. So they really don't do anything in particular to osmoregulate. So you can see that, that fish, which, fish which swim in different environments actually have to do uh, very different things to maintain their water and salt uh, levels at what they need to survive. Now for terrestrial or land-based uh, animals, osmoregulation is actually a little bit different. So to get water in, they actually have to have a drink. So they're not swimming in water, so they've got to go and find it. So if they need water, they have to, you know, go and have a drink. Their um, main concern, terrestrial animals, terrestrial animals' main concern is actually the loss of water um, to the environment. So terrestrial animals can lose water via, via evaporation, you know, sweat evaporating. And they also lose water during the removal of nitrogenous wastes. So, you know, when they wee. So land-based animals can basically uh, excrete nitrogenous wastes or remove them from their body um, by excreting them as urea or uric acid. So humans actually uh, excrete nitrogenous wastes as urea and this urea is concentrated in the kidney before it is excreted. And the excretion of urea is controlled by a hormone called antidiuretic hormone or it's shortened to ADH. So ADH, basically, if the level of antidiuretic hormone increases, you wee less. So if there's not much antidiuretic hormone, you wee more. So I kind of remember antidiuretic hormone, antidiuretic, anti-wee. So more antidiuretic hormone means less wee, and less antidiuretic hormone means more wee. So yeah, the uh, action of antidiuretic hormone in the kidney is, is basically the way that um, water balance is maintained in humans. So that brings episode 16 of the VCE Biology podcast to a close. I'm Mr. Barlow, and thanks for listening.